Thank you, Norman. Hello, and thank you for attending tonight's Thursday, April 29th, 2021, Anama Talk Seminar Series presented by the Sydney County of Honolulu and the Hawaii Sea Grant Hanama Bay Education Program. For the month of April, we are partnering with the Hawaii Audubon Society, and tonight we have the pleasure of hosting Tom Fake. My name is Gavin Iwai, and I am the Hanamo Bay Education Program Outreach Program Coordinator. I have listed my contact information, um, my phone number, as well as email. You need to contact me for outreach opportunities, as well as our Hanama Talks YouTube link, uh, in case you are interested in checking out our past seminars. Uh, so a little background on our, our seminar series, the Hanamo Bay Education Program partners with organizations across Hawaii to showcase educational talks with leading researchers, environmental leaders, natural resource managers, and cultural practitioners. It starts promptly at 6.30 p.m. and ends at 7.30 p.m. This includes a 45-minute presentation time and a 15-minute question and answer session at the end. So just a few friendly reminders um, during the presentation to please keep all your questions till the end of the presentation, or feel free to type it in the chat box at any time and we will address it during the 15 minute question and answer period. Also, uh, please turn off your microphone and video function during the presentation to allow for a smoother seminar. Um, so just a little background on our presenter tonight, Tom. He graduated a degree in environmental science and landscape architecture from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse University. After graduating, he was hired by the U.S. National Park Service and worked for 40 years in national parks, including Yosemite and Grand Canyon. The last 35 years, he's been working here in Hawaii and the Pacific as a project manager and landscape architect. This has included parks throughout the main Hawaiian islands, the far Pacific, including Guam, Saipan, and American Samoa. He is an enthusiastic photographer and has contributed photos to many publications and the National Parks websites. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Tom. Okay, hi everyone. Um, as Gavin said, I used to work for the National Park Service. I'm actually retired now. The, the uh, bio said the last 35 years in Hawaii, but I've been retired now for about 10 years. So um, certainly enjoying retirement, but I also enjoy a great deal working for the National Park Service. So tonight, uh, what I thought we would do is look at some of the bird watching opportunities um, and photography opportunities in East Oahu. And when I uh, talk about East Oahu, I'm very generous in looking at the, uh, the points, uh, say downtown to Kailua and to East Oahu. So, um, one of the um, important things that happened uh, this past January was the new edition of Hawaii Birds was published and printed by the uh, Hawaii, um, or Hawaii uh, Audubon Society. And um, because of that uh, publication, uh, some of the, the um, chapters and other things uh, uh, changed a little bit in, from the previous edition. Now there were, were, was a team of very talented person, persons that wrote this book um, and a number of photographers, including myself, that donated many of the photographs in the book. So I'm not taking any credit for writing the book, but uh, certainly I enjoyed contributing uh, in the way of uh, photographs. Uh, about uh, two months ago now, uh, I was asked to put together this program and, you know, it. Um, it took uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, time to look through my photographs and make sure that um, I had representative photographs of the different, uh, different uh, birds and the different areas or chapters in the book. Um, 
So tonight's a kind of a culmination of all of that. Um, so the new chapters in the uh, Hawaii Birds book includes the following, seabirds, shorebirds, water birds, open country birds, forest birds, and urban birds. And I think one of the important things about the way that the chapters are outlined is that for the average birder or person that's interested in identifying birds, they can go to the area primarily where they saw the bird and look through those, uh, those representative birds that are in that particular area. Um, so we're gonna look at the, the birds that um, are essentially available to us in East Honolulu or East Oahu um, by the different chapters in the book. So the first thing we need to do though is look at some definitions because I think almost all of birding requires us to understand the, the different types of birds that are here in Hawaii and especially how they relate to uh, their arrival and uh, um, some of the important parts of uh, how, how they got here. So first, uh, the endemic birds of Hawaii. The ancestors arrived in Hawaii on their own and eventually evolved into a unique species found naturally nowhere else on the earth. So clearly the endemic birds of Hawaii are some of the most important ones that we have. The second group are the indigenous birds of Hawaii. These birds occur naturally in Hawaii and elsewhere in the world. And they weren't induced by or introduced by humans, but got here naturally. So these are birds and we'll see, see quite a few of them uh, in the presentation. These are birds that actually got here naturally, but also occur elsewhere in the world. Now, sometimes people use the word native and native really covers both endemic or indigenous birds and really means that they occur naturally in an area and they were not introduced by humans. Unfortunately, the next one introduced, a lot of our birds in Hawaii were brought by humans into the area where it does not naturally occur. Now, there were plenty of reasons for that. Uh, some of them were cage birds that were released. Some of them were birds that uh, people felt might, be, um, might contribute to the natural environment. And so we'll see uh, some of those birds tonight as well. Another category is migratory birds, birds that travel in regular movement from one habitat to another. Usually they travel from north to south and south to north in response to weather and food availability. So you'll see some of the our migratory birds as well. Now, one interesting one, and we're gonna show you two different uh, birds that fall into this category, but the, the uh, word is uh, vagrant, which means that a bird was found outside its normal migratory range. And there's actually a lot of interest in these birds because sometimes people have never seen the particular bird before or the, um, the fact that one bird is here in Hawaii and just kind of enjoying Hawaii for what it is and uh, never has been here before or as, our, uh, as we'll look at uh, some of the uh, information in the uh, Bishop Museum's listings of rare birds, these vagrants come and uh, may maybe years between the next uh, the next visit. So let's first look at seabirds. Now, seabirds in Hawaii are pro probably, at least for me anyway, uh, one of the more interesting birds. They're generally uh, birds that stay at sea for months at a time, only returning to land to nest. The birds generally fall into a category called pelagic birds. And to be considered a pelagic bird watcher, however, you would probably have to be on a ship um, with binoculars, I suppose, and looking out from that ship and seeing those birds that fly over the ocean most of the time. But most of us are not pelagic bird watchers. The, most of us are, are what 
the category called sea watchers, which involves watching birds from a fixed location on shore. Um, and this could include many locations in the East Honolulu uh, area along the Ka'iwi shoreline, including Hanauma Bay to Makapu. So these are some of the three tropic birds that exist or, or visit occasionally along the shore in, in Honolulu, um, Ka'iwi shoreline especially. So two of them are classified indigenous, which means that they also exist other places in the world, but uh, they come on a fairly regular basis to uh, the shoreline uh, of uh, Ka'iwi or uh, other places in Honolulu. Um, the most frequent of the tropic birds is the one on the left, the red-tailed tropic bird. Now, currently along the Ka'iwi shoreline, almost any day of the week, you can see large uh, groupings of the, of the red-tailed tropic bird. They're in the process of nesting right now. And as we'll see in some of the other photographs, they have some very interesting mating uh, kind of rituals that they go through and then uh, end up usually in a very uh, small cave-like dwellings, sometimes uh, even uh, uh, perhaps laying eggs uh, along the shore covered by vegetation. So the, the other bird on the far right is an indigenous bird. It's the white-tailed tropic bird. Now, during, during the time that I've been uh, photographing the tropic birds and the times that I've um, uh, been out uh, doing bird watching, I've only encountered the white-tailed tropic bird on Oahu twice. And I'll show you some of, some of the, um, the instances of that. But more often, the white-tailed tropic bird is seen in Kilauea Crater uh, on the Big Island and Kilauea Point on Kauai. They're, they usually tend to be at much higher altitudes uh, rather than, uh, although they, they obviously live off of the sea and live, live uh, by uh, eating fish. Now the third one in the middle is kind of a strange occurrence. This is the red-billed tropic bird. Um, we call it a, a vagrant for now, but over the, the last three years, the red-tailed tropic bird has actually been seen mul multiple times in the last three years. Now here is a special event for me. Um, Super Bowl Sunday this year, February 7th, 2021. And within a half an hour of, of uh, bird watching, I saw all three of the world's tropic birds right off Lanai Overlook. So the red-billed tropic bird, the white-tailed tropic bird, and the, uh, the red-billed, the red-tailed, and the white-tailed tropic bird. So this is a pretty uh, special event for a birder, I'm sure. Um, I had one person tell me though, so the next time you should try to get them all in one frame at the same time. So I'll work on that. So a little bit more detail, the red-tailed tropic bird, the one that we see most frequently, has some very distinct characteristics. So obviously a red, very bright red bill, but the red, what they call the red tail is actually a streamer that's, uh, that comes off of the tail section. But uh, for, um, for discussion purposes, this is actually a streamer, not a tail, because they also have a tail. So their, their flipper feet are black. And sometimes when they tuck them up next to their body, they actually look like they have a ring near the, the back of their body. Um, they're extremely good flyers. They, uh, I'll show you some of the pictures of, of some of their flying characteristics. Now the red-billed tropic bird um, has some very distinct characteristics too. You'll see that the tail is a long white tail or streamer. The beak or bill is red. 
And right near its eye, it looks like somebody took a magic marker and extended the black marking through the eye out to the back. Now that's on, on most, uh, all of the, the red-billed tropic birds I've seen that has that same characteristic. You'll notice too at the, the wing ends, there's black, uh, black uh, attached to the wings. Now the white-tailed tropic bird has distinct characteristics as well. The, the beak is kind of a grayish beige sometimes. It has also a white tail, which gives, gives it its name. The characteristic black markings on the wing tips, but right across the body and into the wings are two large black markings as well. So it's fairly easy when you, when you study the, the three birds to figure out exactly which one is which. Now here's a compilation that I did of photos that I took of the, the red-billed tropic bird. And you see that they have the, the capability of almost stalling in midair and also, also then a kind of a, a delta wing effect where they can fly at a very high speed. They can change direction very quickly. And uh, part, of, part of this stall technique is similar in, in the three birds to their, their mating um, characteristics. This is an interesting thing. In, in 2019, while I was uh, watching our, our red-billed tropic bird here in Hawaii, I noticed that the ABA, the, the American Birding Association declared the bird of the year, the red-billed tropic bird. And this, this uh, the one on the left, which is the, the cover sheet for the ABA's 50th anniversary and the 2019 bird of the year is actually a painting by this uh, person, Megan Massa. And it's of a scene in uh, Maine, the state of Maine, so the, the red-billed tropic bird certainly gets around. But what's interesting too, then in March, 2020, off Lanai Overlook, I took the same photograph or very similar photograph uh, of the red-billed tropic bird here in Hawaii. Now this again is the, the red-tailed tropic bird, giving you an idea of some of the different characteristics of their wings. In the, in the lower left, they actually can scoop around their wings and virtually stop in midair. And then they flutter their wings and can, can uh, move backwards, almost like a helicopter, move backwards uh, in, in flight. Now here's a, a interesting um, approach to a high contrast bird or one that's uh, white. If, if I generally take photographs of the bird against the blue sky or even if actually against a lighter sky, then you don't really get the high contrast. So I often turn and the birds fly against the, the slope of um, Coco Crater. And by uh, also um, a technique of blurring the background, I can get a high uh, definition photograph uh, in using that technique. One of, one of my favorite things is going to air shows. And I, I saw the, these two birds, two red-tailed tropic birds in flight. And I've noticed that uh, when the red-tailed tropic birds are mated and they seem to be a mated pair, there really is no other need for them to do mating dances in the air. And as such, they tend to fly in unison, which is a really interesting thing that because, because um, when I noticed they were flying in unison, I said to myself, I think I've seen something similar to this before. And sure enough, the Navy Blue Angels, the two demonstration uh, planes usually fly in a very, very uh, unison position as well. So I thought that was interesting comparison. 
Now this shows you kind of the, the typical mating dance of the red-tailed tropic birds. Um, they fly very close to each other, they squawk, uh, they dance in the sky like this, and it's very entertaining. And um, hopefully, I think it culminates eventually into um, the, the actual mating. Now, I've been told that the mating occurs not in the sky like it, like it would for a raptor, but they retreat to their chosen, um, uh, chosen nesting area to consummate the mating. Um, after the mating takes place, then an egg is produced. And the red-tailed tropic birds produce only one egg. So they put all of their effort and time into one offspring. Now it takes about 45 days of incubating that one single egg. And both parents incubate the egg during that period of time. Once the chick is actually born, you're looking at another 70 days or so before, before that offspring fledges. And one of the interesting things that I've learned is that these birds do not ever talk to each other, see each other, interact with each other after the bird has fledged. The bird is essentially on its own. The other interesting thing is that there's no practicing of, of uh, flying before, before the fledging. So I think it's a, it, it must obviously be a, an inept char or a characteristic of the birds that they're able to um, instinctively be able to fly off of the nest and survive. So some of the other uh, seabirds that we encounter and can encounter right, right off of Lanai Overlook or the overlooks along the Kaibi shoreline is the red-footed booby. Now this one is uh, an indigenous bird. It comes to Hawaii. It also lives in other places around the world. So it's not, um, uh, a unique species to Hawaii, but it certainly is an entertaining, entertaining uh, bird. Well, this is the, the red-footed booby in flight. And you'll notice that uh, around its beak, um, the different colors, and so it's uh, fairly characteristic of the red-footed booby to have um, the, the, the colorful beak like that. Another bird that's uh, generally uh, along the coast, and um, literally I almost see this bird, a bird, the brown booby, almost every single day. So he does a cruise by when I overlook, looks for fish in the water, and then um, sometimes plunge dives, sometimes comes up with <clears throat> different, uh, different things. Um, I'm sure that they eat uh, all kinds of, of um, fish as well as probably squid and other things. The third of the boobies is uh, the mast booby. A um, little bit rare to see the mast booby, but um, on several days, uh, two weeks ago, two or three of them flew right by Lanai Overland. Another thing that we can see almost every single day is the city turns returning from probably um, uh, island-wide trip of some sort for fishing. Um, most of the city terns uh, that I know um, in this area um, have nests over by uh, uh, Rabbit Island uh, in that area of Makapu. Um, and uh, you can see they, they have a very uh, characteristic coloration with white on the underside, uh, white near their face, and then uh, kind of jet black on top. About <clears throat> three years ago, I was on Lanai Overlook watching for whales. And sure enough, a laysan albatross came right over the, the top and circled around a little bit and then flew off. But I was able to get this photograph. So it followed uh, two or three days of really heavy wind. So it may have been one of the Kaana Point albatross, 
but um, out of focus way in the background is uh, um, Cocoa Head and uh, the direction towards Hanama Bay. So <clears throat> it is actually possible to sail, see a Laysan albatross along the coast. Now, one of the things even at uh, standing uh, by Lanai Overlook is the white terns return from fishing expeditions and they fly into the small cove to the Hanama Bay side of uh, the Lanai Overlook. And I see them uh, heading directly over the shooting range and probably into their nesting sites that are, that are most likely in the uh, uh, Cocoa Head District Park area. But I've, uh, I've never gone uh, searching for the white tern in there yet, but I've, I've seen them many times coming, coming off the ocean. Um, one of the interesting things is my first encounter with the white tern, and at the time they were calling it the fairy tern, but I did a lot of work in Saipan, uh, Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, north of Guam. And there, there are actually many white terns in Saipan. And many of the local people believe that those are actually the souls of people that were lost during World War II. So um, the white tern certainly has uh, some very cultural uh, significance for a lot of the people in, in the Pacific. This is a small um, white tern as well, a white tern chip. So sometimes you get uh, kind of a, a double luck. Uh, so this is a obviously a um, humpback whale that was offshore of Lanai Overlook this year. And uh, while we were just there watching for birds or whales, uh, this this whale showed itself in one of my better pictures of whales this year. So the next category we're going to talk about is shorebirds. And obviously, from the definition, you know that these are birds that hang out along along the coast, but normally uh, probably in um, beach areas and um, most of these birds are um, migratory in the sense that their their uh, their um, breeding grounds might be in the Arctic during the summer, and then return to Hawaii in the winter time. Some also also um, winter over, um, depending on the the climatic conditions. Uh, so along the saltwater beaches is not the only places that shorebirds tend to hang out. So they might hang out in wetlands and ponds and maybe even uh, golf course uh, water traps, who knows. But uh, these are birds that uh, generally are not water birds in the sense that they get wet, but um, uh, they're, they're birds that hang out, uh, as I say, along the shore. So one of them that we see fairly often um, along Ka'iwi shoreline is the ruddy turnstone. Uh, this is a migratory bird, so it takes off and goes other places uh, during the during the winter or during the summer, and then comes and returns to us during the winter. So it's also indigenous, which means that it it belongs uh, essentially to the world, and it comes back to Hawaii to visit. So this was a quick shot I got a couple of weeks ago of the ruddy turnstone of traveling along the coast. And as I say, they're not water birds, but they're gonna be landing soon along the coast and looking for uh, anything um, that can be um, eaten off of the rocks, et cetera. Sanderling is a, another indigenous migratory bird that comes back to Hawaii, and we see quite often. And the Pacific Golden Plover, also considered at this point a, a, a shorebird, but also
also probably an urban bird as well. Uh, indigenous migratory, the male uh, Pacific golden plover. Wandering tattler, uh, indigenous migratory bird that's often seen in the, the shore uh, along the shoreline. Semi-palmated semi uh, sandpiper, indigenous and migratory as well. Long-billed thawicher, indigenous and migratory. So now we'll get to water birds. The water birds obviously like, like to go in the water. Um, mostly the water birds though are uh, wetland type water birds. These are not necessarily seabirds. They, these, although they probably could go into salt water, but they prefer either brackish or fresh water. Now, one of the ones that uh, we can see here in Hawaii Kai quite frequently is the black crowned night heron. It's indigenous, which also means that it, um, it belongs to the rest of the world as well as Hawaii. Um, this was a shot that I took uh, over in Kailua um, at a, a place that I really enjoy going to, and that's the, the Hamakua uh, Drive um, wetlands that are behind the Kaiser, uh, Kaiser uh, Kailua um, facility. Um, the black crown night heron also, once it uh, leaves the ground, it doesn't, uh, uh, when it's on the ground, it doesn't look that formidable as far as wing size. But um, and if, you, if you get the right angle, you get this nice uh, effect of the sunlight coming through the wings as it's flying. This is the black crown night heron, but it's the immature one. So it's probably, um, a year old or less, and um, characteristically, it's much different than than its uh, mature uh, adult version. But has the same uh, same feeding habits. Essentially, um, honkers down in the grass and watches for a fish to go by, and grabs it. One of the Interesting things is that there's uh, now quite a few different um, recordings of the birds learning uh, to actually fish with, uh, with either dropping a pedal or drop, dropping a pebble or dropping something into the water, which in areas where the fish are generally fed anyway, uh, the fish will come to the surface. So there's a story of one, uh, one black crown night heron in Kapolei that uh, sits there and drops a pebble in and boom, grabs the fish as soon as it comes to the surface. So interesting adaptation. So the Hawaiian coot is both endemic, which means that it's evolved naturally in Hawaii and it's its own species. And in addition, it's an endangered um, bird. So this is a special bird for us, um, one that um, certainly the, um, the, nat uh, the authorities that are in charge of these kinds of uh, natural uh, areas are very concerned about maintaining uh, environments and habitats to protect these birds. Now, one of the, <laughs> the areas uh, just recently that I visited is the uh, Pearl Harbor National Wildlife Refuge. Um, there's a, you probably know this, but there's a bike trail that goes along, uh, along Pearl Harbor. It's actually literally called the Pearl Harbor Bike Trail. So there's several places along that bike trail that you can uh, get close to uh, one of the areas where these birds can be um, can be viewed. Um, so there's a new uh, elevated viewing platform that's along the bike trail, 
And if you look up um, uh, in the um, probably Google search or anything, uh, it's called the Betty Bliss um, Wildlife uh, Viewing Platform. Uh, this was a, a teacher that uh, worked at McKinley High School and uh, was involved heavily in the, pro, the development of the Pearl Harbor National Wildlife Refuge. So uh, last week we were there and saw several of the Hawaiian coots and several, uh, several young um, immature uh, birds as well. Now, one of the other endemic endangered birds is the Hawaiian galano or moorhen. There are moorhens very similar to this uh, that exist on the mainland, but this has developed into its own species. So that's where it gets the endemic category. And again, uh, the protection of the wildlife areas is very important because as you can imagine, some of the um, the pressures that are on these birds come from um, their arch enemies, dogs, cats, um, and rats, and other things that are uh, not native to Hawaii. So even at that uh, National Wildlife Refuge in Pearl, Pearl Harbor, there's a, um, a predator fence, which is, um, the entire area where these birds uh, currently reside. So the predator fence is there to, to keep out um, dogs, cats, et cetera. And um, I think the, the future is probably um, a good one for the birds that find their way into that, into that area. So one of the um, endemic endangered birds that we have in Hawaii too, the Hawaiian stilt. And you can see this, matter of fact, uh, Kamilawiki Hill and the, the playground right near the uh, skateboarding area. Uh, probably at least once a week, I see stilts in that area. So even right here on Hawaii Kai, um, it's very easy to see stilts once you get to the, the Hamakua, um, the marsh area there. Um, so this is one of the, the important birds. Uh, this is the Hawaiian stilt, uh, again, but in flight. So it has a very interesting characteristic where it drops its, uh, or pulls its feet back and makes itself into a, a streamlined aerodynamic uh, a bird. Now here's a, Here's a comparison between the Hawaiian stilt on the left, our endemic endangered stilt, and where it came from, which is believed to be the black neck stilt. Uh, this, the black neck stilt on the right is, was taken by me in Oregon. And the interesting thing is that the changes that have occurred over time with the Hawaiian stilt has given it, it its own, um, species. So that's where the endemic part came in. So at one point, who knows when, but um, a group of mating black neck stilts find their, found their way to Hawaii. And then from that, <clears throat> over time, the Hawaiian stilt emerges as an endemic bird only found in Hawaii. So here's a, a a typical or uh, fairly easy to see mallard duck in Hawaiian water. Uh, it was first introduced in the 1930s. Um, I guess someone thought it was uh, uh, important to have the duck here in Hawaii, but it's pretty much uh, taken over many areas. Um, the second duck though that um, resembles or, or closely um, resembles the mallard. Unfortunately, was an endemic endangered duck uh, called the Hawaiian duck. So one of the identifying features of the Hawaiian duck, the one on the right, the female, kind of an orange bill, and then uh, the, the bluish colored um, 
uh, insert on the side on their side, which is actually part of their wing feathers. Now, some of the other um, birds that show up in Hawaii during the winter time might include the northern shoveler and or the northern pinfield. These two sets of, of ducks are fairly regular migratory visitors to Hawaii. So it's possible at any of the wetland areas in Hawaii to see either one of these birds during, during the winter. It, that actually is not an unusual occurrence at all. Now we're gonna talk about um, open country birds here and they're very few, but a um, couple of, of note. So um, I quite frequently go up into the Cocoa Crater Botanical Garden and there are certainly a couple of sections in there that are open country areas as defined. So these are uh, pasture areas, open areas where um, you know, birds can, can find the uh, uh, grasslands and other things. And if you look closely in the photograph, there's actually a bird. So a lot of the open country birds try to hide themselves by camouflage. So this is the Gray Franklin introduced to Hawaii. Um, it's not unusual to see this bird up in the uh, Cocoa Crater Botanical Garden. Um, usually there's more than one, there's a couple and they have a, a rather um, strenuous warning call when they see a, a person nearby. The second bird uh, in their open category for Waikai area, the peregrine falcon. So the peregrine falcon has actually been seen in the, in the slopes of Coco Crater. Um, but most recently, the per a peregrine falcon was seen at the Hilton Hawaiian Village, one of the towers. So <clears throat> don't know if they're staying there, but um, in any case, they came in for a visit to Hawaii this year. So it's a rare sighting for sure. They're a migratory bird. They're considered a, a visitor to Hawaii. So the next category is forest birds. And unfortunately, when we, when we talk about forest birds in Hawaii, uh, especially around this area, there are very few native forest birds uh, to be seen. Um, if you pick up a copy of the, the latest edition, you can go to the forest birds section, the native forest birds, and most of them are on the neighbor islands. And some only few of uh, the native forest birds that are supposed to be on Oahu are obviously difficult to find because they're in usually in higher elevations. And so you, you have to be a good hiker in order to get into those areas where the bird might be found. Uh, so just a couple of days ago, we, um, my wife and I took a trip uh, up to Aiea Loop Trail, which was pretty pretty area for sure, but uh, looking for the one or one of the native forest birds on Oahu, the uh, Oahu elipayo. And unfortunately that trip uh, didn't produce uh, the results that we wanted. So I don't have any photographs of that. Um, so let's look at some of the forest birds. Um, and in this case, the non-native forest birds. So one of the interesting birds that I've encountered in the last year uh, is the red-billed uh, Lyothrix. Now the Lyothrix was introduced to Oahu back in 1917 first, and then I guess another group in 1936. <clears throat> this bird lately has been uh, very visible in Coco Crater. And this picture was taken about two months ago. Um, it's a very pretty bird, uh, but it also, in 1938, I believe, was one of the first birds that encountered avian malaria in Hawaii. 
So during that period of time, the population of the red-billed Lyothrix um, diminished quite a bit. At one time, people said that the, the uh, bird was actually the most prominent bird on the big island to be seen. And it's almost not even, not even uh, around any longer on the big island. So um, in the 1980s, apparently, um, these birds uh, came back a little bit. And now it seems like uh, they're even taking, taking off again. So this is a, a picture that I took uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So a small little red-billed Lyothrux. Um, looks like a family group. And one of the birds that you can see almost every single day up in uh, Coco Crater is the white rump shama introduced in 1940. And these birds are pretty entertaining. They see you coming and they start talking to you. Um, they seem like they're gonna go away and they fly away, but then they come back and then they talk to you more. And then, uh, so they're very friendly birds. And uh, they kind of have the appearance of a robin, but with a long tail. And then obviously the, the white rump uh, feathers that are, that are um, near their tail. So one of the um, pictures that you'll see of the elipayo, which is the native bird, native forest bird, um, actually looks a little bit like an immature white rump shama. So a lot of people will say, oh, I saw the elipayo up in Coco Crater, but most likely this is what they're saying, the white rump shama immature. So the last one we're gonna go over is uh, the urban birds. Now urban birds, um, as you'll see, were mostly imported to Hawaii. So from the 1920s until the 1960s, Hawaii government agencies and a private club called Hui Manu Society introduced birds from around the world to Hawaii. They did it because they wanted to, to see beautiful feathers and have the birds eat insects and to create uh, you know, uh, a different uh, atmosphere, I guess, in the forest. But these, along with pet birds, also escaped over the decades. And many of these non-native birds are now one seen throughout parks and yards in Honolulu. So some of the the birds, the non-native birds are harmless, but others can cause significant damage. Eating native bird eggs or even chicks, the non-native harmful species also compete for available food and habitat, sometimes hybridized, hybridizing with native birds. And I should have mentioned that uh, when we're talking about the intersection between common mallard mallard ducks and the Hawaiian duck. There's very few pure Hawaiian ducks left, at least on Oahu, because most of the Hawaiian ducks have interbred now with common mallards. So that's kind of the danger in introducing species and then not really uh, having an impact assessment to, to determine. So in addition, um, you may have heard this, but the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the I, IUCN, met in Hawaii in 2016. It's an important international organization. And one of the things that they have developed is a list of the 100 most invasive alien species in the world. And guess what? On the list are three birds, and Hawaii has two of them. So you can see the impact that that causes. A, an international organization telling us that out of the 100 worst birds for invasive species in the world, Hawaii's got two of them. So I'll talk, talk a little bit more about that. So the Northern Cardinal was one of those birds introduced in 1929. 
it's uh, not necessarily classified as an invasive bird just yet. The Northern Cardinal male is a pretty bird. Uh, a lot of people see this bird up in the Cocoa Crater Botanical Garden. Uh, they, they do very well up there as far as breeding and uh, the population. One of the interesting things, and I, I mentioned the word vagrant before, but just recently in January, uh, this bird species showed up in Hawaii. Now the bird is the, the one in the two right pictures as well as the front bird in the picture. This is a great egret. Now, it wasn't that surprising to me because uh, having traveled to Oregon and a lot of different places um, on the mainland, I'm used to seeing a great egret. So this wasn't one that would check off my list of I've never seen this bird, bird before. So what's interesting is that this bird showed up at the Oahu Club on Hawaii Kai Drive. And it stayed there for about three or four days. Uh, so these pictures I took while it was there. And then suddenly it was gone. No one knew where it was had taken off to or what its destination was or anything. But guess what? So two, a week ago when I was at the Pearl Harbor National Wildlife Refuge, there was the great egret again. So it's hanging out in Hawaii. So if you've never seen a great egret and you wanted to check that off of your list, uh, easy way to do that would be fly to fly to Oregon or Washington, but if you want to see it also at the, the National Wildlife Refuge in Pearl Harbor, uh, he was there a week ago. So the cattle grip, we all know this bird probably from following um, lawnmowers around Waikai, but that bird was introduced in 1959. And it is listed now on the Injurious Wildlife List 2014 for the state of Hawaii. This is not one of the birds uh, in the uh, IUCN's 100 birds that's coming up. So the Japanese white eye was introduced in 1929. Uh, almost every single day I see this bird um, in, uh, in Cocoa Crater. Um, also, I've been told that the white eye um, is probably one of the most prominent urban birds that are seen in Southern California right now. So it's on the uh, state's list of wildlife that are injurious to others. Pretty bird though. The Java sparrow, also another pretty bird, introduced in the 1960s and is also on our injurious Common waxbill introduced in 1970, but not on the list. The chestnut munia introduced in 1941, also on the injurious list. The scaly breasted munina introduced in 1866, a long time ago, but hasn't really reproduced enough to put it on the list. And bingo. The common mina, mina bird introduced in 1865, long time ago, is not only on the state's injurious wildlife list, but it also is one of the three birds, the IUCN's list of 100 of the world's worst invasive alien species. So even though you see the, the sassy little common, uh, common mina bird, uh, it's a pretty, pretty bad listed bird um, for injury to an um, uh, invasive species. Another urban bird, the house finch, can be seen almost every single day. House sparrow, uh, saffron finch, yellow fronted canary, red crested cardinal, red whiskered oval also on the injurious wildlife list. But here's our second candidate for the 100 worst 
This is the red vented bobo. Virtually see this every single day at the Coco Crater. Chickens introduced along the way and rock pigeon, zebra dove, and a spotted dove. Now I wanna just show you a little bit about the equipment that I use. So um, originally most of the camera equipment was classified as a digital single lens reflex camera. That means that there was a mirror inside the camera and basically what you see uh, through the lens is what you're gonna get on, on the film. But recently, um, there was a paradigm shift in photography. And that shift was that most of the cameras will probably end up being mirrorless. Uh, so they're, they're digital, yes, but they're, there's no single lens reflex part of them. Several of the things that really are important when this shift took place is that you can get up to 20 frames per second um, when you're taking a photograph. So also the photographs, um, there's no sound which comes out of the camera. So those 20 photographs uh, just uh, are from the pushing down of a, a button. Uh, several of the other features are that it has a built-in artificial intelligence on autofocusing, and I'll show you how that, how that helps. Now the, this photograph on the right is my camera setup with a targeting device, which is designed for cameras. It's actually made by Nikon and not Canon, but you can see the targeting device. So when I see a whale or a bird, all I have to do is point that target towards the, the um, whale or the bird, and then look through uh, the viewfinder and I'm right on target with the bird. So that helps a lot in quick, quick focus and quick uh, alignment to the bird. You'll notice that there's a, a red uh, box around the eye of this bird. So this is what actually comes out um, when I first look at uh, looking at the sample of the shot that I just took. And it's actually, the camera is telling me that it found the eye of this bird and it locked the focus in on the eye. So this is the, the new type of camera that we're looking at. Um, I mean, it's almost cheating, to be honest, because as soon as that uh, red box is locked onto the eye, no matter where that bird goes in the frame, as long as I keep it in the frame, it's going to stay in focus. So this, this is a photo I took this January. And to show you the, the amazing capabilities of these cameras, so this is the International Space Station. It's got a lot of press in the last couple of days. 248 miles above Hawaii, 17,500 miles per hour, it's moving across. You go to an app and it tells you exactly when the International Space Station is going to fly over Hawaii. And so I know the approximate direction and I know the altitude. And so all I do is go out on my front yard and set up my camera. And these are two photographs that I took on the night of January 16th. Um, you can, on the right-hand side, you can actually see the solar uh, arrays on both ends of it. And I actually think that the, the capsule is still attached to the International Space Station. Uh, this Saturday, they're, they're supposed to splash down um, near Pensacola again, bringing bringing back uh, four of the astronauts that were on the space station. So I had the uh, privilege of going to um, the mainland during the great eclipse in August uh, 19, or 2017. And um, so this is a picture that I took um, with special uh, lenses and special uh, filters against sunlight. And you can see the, the solar flares. Now, the only time that you'll ever um, be able to see a solar flare like that is when the moon is actually making a, uh, a nice disk right around, right in front of the sun. 
So one of the pictures that I took recently, and this was around Christmas time this year, um, was a setting sun at Mauna Loa Bay. And I noticed that, um, that there was sort of a, a green tinge around as the sun was starting to, to go down below the, the horizon. Now there's two effects that have to happen um, to make a green flash. And one of them obviously is a clear, uh, clear shot uh, through the atmosphere to the sun. But the second is a, a mirage effect. So the mirage effect is actually showing us part of the sun when the sun is actually below the horizon. So this is a, a zoom in on that particular area. So this is the green flash. So if you notice uh, on the left-hand side at the bottom, um, I have the little acronym for the rainbow, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So what you're seeing there is the green, um, the green parts of light uh, coming through and that immediate flash would be the green flash that, that people see. Now the green flash is rare enough, but here's a second one that I took. And this is actually the blue past the green, the blue and maybe even a little bit of the indigo and violet colors. So this is even a rarer shot of the blue flash. So there we are at the end of the, the talk. So this is a, a, a butterfly that's frequently seen in Cocoa Crater as well. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, so leave the floor open for any questions for Tom. I'm gonna keep through the chat right now. See if anybody asks any questions. I just want to say I love the uh, black crown night heron in flight, and just the wing, the wing feathers. Just oh my god, beautiful. Okay, hey, Gavin, I see Adriana asked if we could go over the vocabulary once more. Okay, uh, Tom, could you go over the vocabulary once more? Oh, like indigenous and... Um, oh, the definitions? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Is that the one you wanted? Yeah. Is that the one you wanted, uh, Adriano? Okay, I see a question from Andrew. Does the population of the seabirds seem to be increasing based on your observations? And uh, generally, the, the answer is yes. I, I think um, um, some of the, the birds that, um, well, uh, last year, for instance, there were approximately 100 nesting birds. Um, nest, uh, nest, not nesting birds, 100 nests. So that would be 200 nesting birds. Um, and they produced uh, approximately 50 fledglings. So for that um, relatively small area, 
um, I think the population is fairly good. I think I read that um, back in 1970, there were, there were much less the, of the nesting birds. So hopefully uh, after they fledge, they still have the uh, feeling of coming back to that same area to nest themselves. But it would still be three years probably at least of being on their own before they came back to um, Kaidi shoreline. Uh, there's another question by Pat. Uh, Pat, you want to ask Tom your question? Oh, okay. Uh, about how much time do you spend uh, per week looking for photos? Or oh, just looking for photos or ta oh, you mean uh, taking <laughs> photos? Well, going hunting for photos. Oh, hunting for photos. Well, I'm retired, so I have a little bit of free time. Uh, um, I probably spend at least uh, an hour um, most days. Wow. But I incorporate that into my uh, exercise program. So exercising to go go up to Cocoa Crater is not a not a hardship. <laughs> Uh, very uh, fabulous photos. Thank you so much. And I also wanted to mention that uh, the full set of definitions are in the Hawaii Birds Glossary. Thanks right. for asking about that. So uh, just a, a word about the book. Uh, it's for sale at the uh, um, Hawaiian Audubon Society store and you can get online and find that pretty easily. Uh, if you don't want to pay the shipping costs, you can, I think, uh, still pick it up uh, by notifying them and they'll do curbside delivery. Oh, uh, Paul asked, do you have an Instagram account? Um, you know what? I, don't share photos very often, um, so I don't have uh, an Instagram account, no. Uh, my, um, my way of contributing is like, um, is uh, contributing my photographs to the books and other things. Um, I'm a little leery of sharing my photographs um, on Instagram and other, other uh, sites. Uh, Andrew has a question. Andrew, you want to ask Tom your question? Or I can ask it too. <laughs> Does anyone ban the tropic birds? And if yes, have you seen banded birds? I personally have never seen um, a banded bird. Uh, there, there was... Um, a time in, I think it was 2007, that a, a red-billed tropic bird was seen. And then uh, at that time, they banded uh, two of the birds that they, that they captured and then released. Um, to my knowledge, neither one of those birds returned. Uh, so there was no uh, connection between. So it's, it's kind of odd that the, um, the red-billed tropic birds seem to come back every year, but we don't know whether those are the same birds or... Um, another interesting thing about the red-billed right now is that the red-billed tropic bird that we've been seeing for uh, over a month uh, lost its white tail, the long streamer tail, in sometime in March. And so it's... Uh, it looks very much like a red-billed tropic bird. I mean, a red-tailed tropic bird because it doesn't have the long white tail. But we think that the tail is probably going to regenerate. They do periodically. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Uh, Tom, how much does your camera equipment weigh? Um, the new camera equipment weighs less than 
uh, the, the original DSLR that I was looking at, but I think it weighs probably around four or five pounds. So it's not a light, um, I carry a backpack that um, has a waist, waist strap that takes a lot of the weight away from there. In addition, um, I use a, uh, a single, single pole um, attached to a, um, a gimbal, which allows me to have, um, <clears throat> to transfer the weight to the, to the um, monopod. And then the gimbal also allows you to uh, spin, the, spin the camera almost 360 degrees and vertically as well. Wow. Andrew has another question. He asked, do you see any pu'eo in your area? I, I have never seen a pu'eo, no. There may have been, there may have been sightings of barn owls at one point, but, um, and I believe I did see a barn owl in Hawaii Kai, but other than that, no. Anyone else have any questions? Um, I see it's seven, about almost 7.45. So once again, thank you to our presenter, Tom, for wonderful pictures and very far with talk. Um, I would like, also like to um, thank uh, my coworker, Morgan, for helping me behind the scenes, uh, letting in people and putting links up. Please feel free to check out our Hanama Talks channel as well as um, our HBEP Hanawa Bay Education Program website um, for information. Um, and for concerning the Thursday evening lectures, um, we will be taking a brief hiatus, um, but we also will be um, a lot, I guess, looking at other outreach opportunities. So um, just kind of tune into our website or our Hanama Talks channel for information. And with that, um, I want to say aloha and mahalo. Thanks, Tom. Wow, wonderful.